So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about fruit and fruit inspectors and go through some examples in the scriptures uh, to actually exhort you, to uplift you and encourage you because a lot of people are getting high and mighty because of their fruit and looking down and discouraging others because of their lack of fruit. And I just want to, you know, put it into that, you know, at least attempt to. So, uh, what I actually have here, I'll explain. Uh, what I have here with 1 Samuel 2.5, it's just a verse I wanted to put up for you to look at, along with 2 Peter uh, 118 there, I mean 18, because it talks about fruit bearing. Where in 1 Samuel 2 5, it talks about how there's a woman that had, I believe it says, seven children, but she's become, I can't remember the word it uses, but basically, you know, not so productive. But then the barren woman, is being blessed and I'm going to talk about that that's like a foundation for this video is talking about the women of the Bible and here in 2nd Peter 1 8 it says for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, I wanted to bring this one up because you see how it connects barren with being unfruitful? And that's why I have here barren ground written right here. Because the, a lot of the stuff we're going to look at here, uh, we're going to run into a lot of barren women where they are unfruitful. And before I get into that, I, I need to lay a little bit of a foundation with this as well. Where women... represents something. Women equal physical aspect of reality. So let me write this out here. They represent the physical. They represent the earth. You know, being barren and unfruitful, right? Because if the earth is unfruitful, it's barren. And if the woman's womb is barren, she's unfruitful, right? So we got that connection there. And most importantly, something I don't think a lot of people, matter of fact, I don't know anybody who talks about this, where women actually represent all of mankind. And you may think that's a bit strange, because wouldn't mankind represent that? I mean, you know, the, the male. And it, that's no. The, the male actually represents the spirit, God. And women represent all of us. Whether you like that or not, 
whether you can handle that humble pie or not. That That's the truth here. You see, with our relation to God, we are women. And I, I'll talk about this a little bit to explain. With a man, you have an XY chromosome. So you see how they are, what you would say, complete. Having the female, we'll say, a negative charge and the male positive charge. And since the male and female are together, you're male because the female, the physical, submits to the male, the spiritual. That's why you don't have to be YY to be a male. But you see, the complete, a male has both, an XY, right? And having the Y, having the male, they have the spirit. All right, this represents completion, being whole, All right? While a female represents all of us, where we have XX, we don't have the Y. We're, we have a double negative here, All right? The female. And we don't have the spirit. And you see, that's how the, the female is different, right? She's like inverted from the male. I shouldn't have to explain what I mean by inverted. And this is because of not having the spirit, right? So the female, like all mankind, needs to receive the seed from the man. So the seed is what you're going to produce fruit from, right? This equals the word of God because you can receive words from your father, your mother, your caregivers, your brothers and sisters, from the TV, from the government. As you grow up, in those words that you're receiving will produce fruit. And that fruit is your character, your morality, right? And it's based on the words that were planted into your heart. Uh, because ultimately, we are all the females, spiritually speaking. And we are like the earth that receives seed, and we can only produce what we're given. Right, So if we're given seed to grow poison ivy, we can't grow corn. Right, We need the seed for corn to grow corn. So if you want to produce something godly, something holy, something righteous, you need God's seed. You need his word. So just like the female, she needs to receive this from the male and then she can take that and be born again. That's why you have Eve being excited that she gives birth to a man-child, Cain, and possibly a twin, could have been born shortly after through another conception, but it seems as though that's not the case. Seems like this was twins here. Cain and Abel, but Cain is the first. Abel is the second. You're going to see a lot of connections between first and second. The first, not always the best. Usually not. It's the second. Uh, like the first king of Israel. Not good. The second one, fantastic. Right? Saul and then David. So you, you got the, always get that symbolism. That's why you have Jesus saying the first will be last and the last will be first because it's the same switching we see throughout the scriptures, right? Or Cain, you can see here Eve conceiving. Uh, you can say this is from the word of Satan. So we'll just put a W-S. She can only produce from what she's given. She received the word 
of Satan, the lies, right? Cain represents the child born from that seed. That's why we're told, I don't remember if it's Jude or John tells us that Cain is born of that wicked one. Might have been Paul who said it. Or even Peter, I don't remember actually, off the top of my head. In Abel, this is the righteous. He received the righteous seed because you see how he wasn't trying to be justified by his works. This is the word of Satan who is always about being justified by your works. Your works of not sinning, keeping the Ten Commandments, keeping the law, right? You doing the religious rituals and all the good works. You're producing fruit. You see how he brings his fruit to God. And then this fellow here doesn't bring any fruit. No, we're going to X that out. There's no fruit here. He brings a lamb, shed blood. And so Cain is upset. Like, I actually brought fruit. I'm producing fruit and brought fruit. And I'm rejected. And Abel's not producing any fruit. And he's accepted. This is BS. You see, Cain is the first fruit inspector. Yeah, you know, he's judging fruit. And he's like, I got the fruit. You don't. God's going to accept me, not you. And then when they're judged, God doesn't accept him and accepts Abel. And he's like, what? Because you see, he's following the word of, from Satan. You can be like God. And you can be justified by the law because you can become perfect in the flesh in this life. But you see the flesh, XX, right here, the female, needs to be born again. And you notice that with a woman, as she's from childhood and she's developing, she has a certain attitude. A lot of times, like these days, you see a lot of like selfishness, right? Self-absorbed, attention-seeking. But then, you know, not all the time, but you'll see a vast change in a woman once she has a child. You know, a lot more, uh, I guess who I would say, docile and calm about things and a little bit more serious in thinking about her child. Right, not so much self-absorbed anymore. You know, there's a change. Right? And that is a picture for us of being born again. How it's all about us, but then we lay down our life and give our life to God to produce a new creature within us. And that new creature is not self-absorbed, but selfless. And we change after we have been born again, or in this case, given birth, right? So then we go from XX and we are changed into the body of Christ, who is XY, and that Y came from God. So the XY now being born again, it is us with God and he's in us right we're intertwined married we become one flesh and as first Corinthians 6 17 says we have become one spirit right we become one word with God as Jesus says in John 6 63 his word is spirit and it is life and in Acts it talks about how the people being born again were added to the word of God the word of God grew you see that? All these connections telling us about this everywhere through creation and the science like showing you here. And it shows us it through sprinkled throughout the word of God. It tells us basically the same thing over and over in different ways. And that's how you learn. You learn by repetition. Like you're training uh, to do more push-ups, just something simple like that. Well, you start by doing some push-ups, right? You might not be able to do a lot. You might not be able to do a, with good form. You might have to do them on your knees the first time. 
and then you you develop strength as you do them more and more and then all of a sudden you're, you're doing a bunch and you're doing perfect form and you're just repetition all of a sudden you're doing it very well and then you're doing different types of push-ups right so you now you're looking at the push-up from different angles you're doing close uh, hand placement diamond push-ups you're doing uh, wide hand placement way out past the shoulder push-ups you're doing like dive bomb push-ups uh, feet elevated push-ups one-legged push-ups one arm push-ups right you're, you're doing the same thing but from different angles and as you go through it over and over you develop more and more skill and this same way you better know God as you're going through the word over and over and you see this repetition over and over as what I'm going to show you here is a lot of this repetition because then we have with after Eve here we have Hagar and Sarah Hagar again is first right and she produces fruit she perverse produces Ishmael We'll put ish here and if you go back and read in Genesis uh, Hagar started to look down on Sarah because she she had a child and Sarah didn't and Sarah did not like that and wanted to get rid of her right so you see how Hagar was producing fruit acting just like Cain she produced fruit and now she's high and mighty and she's above Sarah even though that fruit as we're told in Galatians chapter 4, Hagar represents Mount Sinai and the law given at Moses, uh, from Moses, uh, to start the old covenant, the first covenant. And that first covenant was about self-righteousness, about you being justified by the law, but the law doesn't justify anybody. But you see this fruit, this first one being brought forth, you're bringing forth fruit, right? But it's... Just like with Cain, it's not accepted. It's the second Sarah who brings forth a child of promise, representing again being born again. You know, Jesus being born from a virgin. And Jesus represents us as we are born into his body at the cross, being born again. It's an a immaculate conception, as Galatians 4 talks about how we are of we are from Isaac. The child of promise, born of the spirit, not of the flesh. Right? So you see this this side here, you're going to see is about faith. And the people who are of works look down on you. You're going to see this. As Galatians 4 also says that those born of the flesh persecute those born of the spirit. And this is what you're going to see here is works. That doesn't mean you don't seek to produce works and fruit, right? It's that you don't think that makes you anything special. Because, of course, Eve wanted to bring forth another child after Abel was put down by Cain. And Sarah, she wanted to bring forth a child, and she ended up doing it. And then we have Rachel. Like you see, you notice how it like skips a generation kind of thing? It's a repetition where... Rachel is kind of like Eve, where she brings forth twins. She brings forth uh, Esau, firstborn, and Jacob, the secondborn. But you notice how the first will be last and the last will be first. You see how, again, this is a switched places here, where Esau sells his birthright. But you see Esau also was fruitful, where he was able to take care of himself and take care of his parents with his skill, skill in hunting and other such things. I'm sure he had other skills besides hunting. And his parents didn't approve of the wife and wives that he took, but he produced children, right? He's producing all this fruit. But it's Jacob who is the one who is blessed. The second born. No, it's always the second. Then we have, from Jacob, Leah and Rachel. Right? Leah, very fruitful. Not that Leah here is necessarily evil, but she is very fruitful. 
I think she produces four sons before Rachel produces anything. It says Rachel was barren. But then eventually, she ends up producing Joseph. And he's the only one out of the 12, or it's 13 children, but the 12 sons of Jacob who represents Jesus. You can make an argument that Judah does, but the life of Joseph represents Jesus. Or even Mary's a Gentile bride before the seven-year famine, the time of Jacob's trouble, the Great Tribulation, right? So you see, again, it's the the one who is barren brings forth the promised child. You know, eventually produces a fruit that surpasses all the fruit before it. And then Hannah, you might not remember her, but she is also barren. And she's the second wife. And the first wife has children and looks down on Hannah, right? It's again the same story. The fruitful are have their nose in the air and look down on the rest of them who might not have the same fruit they got, right? Sometimes it's about like soul winning. And you can take this to be soul winning, right? Where, yeah, they're winning over converts. Like let's take Eve, for example. You can say, oh, her first convert is Cain and then Abel. Well, her first convert wasn't a true convert, right? And ended up killing the true convert. Right? So she's at 50-50 there with her converts. Half of them aren't even true converts right there, right? And then she loses the true ones because she brought in the, the false one. The same thing happens with a lot of these Christians that become fruitful where they're producing vast amounts of so-called believers and converts. You know, people who use the prosperity gospel and other such things. You, you bring in a lot when you go fishing. As you know, when you're trying to get the fruit, it's also representative of being fishers of men. You throw out the net, you catch a lot of good fish with the bad fish. Sometimes you catch more bad fish than good fish, right? As you know, sometimes you got to throw most of them back. But you see, they don't want to throw any of them back. So then the bad fish ruin the good fish because it ends up being with converts. It's like apples. You have a bad apple, it ruins the rest. And they don't want to throw the toxic ones out because they think they're being, I don't know, judgmental or something. They don't want to do the right thing and they don't want to be like, well, I'm going to get rid of my converts. I want to keep my converts, especially if, you know, those converts that are not truly converts, they like to give more money because they like to prove that they're fruitful. Like I prove that I'm saved by giving more money. Right. But it's for you to enable their ways and then they ruin the rest of the converts or end up pushing the true converts away where you will have a huge field of tares. And you think you're being fruitful. Right? Like Ishmael. You could say he's a tear. Oh yeah, you were fruitful. But you produced some poison ivy here. Some poison oak. You produced something that's toxic and not edible and not usable. So you can brag there about your fruit. But a lot of times with the fruit here, it's self-righteousness. But Hannah, bearing and then praying, she ends up giving birth to Samuel, who ends up being a mighty, important figure in Israel, judging Israel himself his whole life, anointing the first king of Israel, Saul, and David, the second king of Israel. Very important figure. And then we have, after her, Underline her. We got uh, a wife here, and I don't recall her name. I went to look for it, but it seems like she's referred to as uh, Manoah's wife from Judges. Is it? I can't remember if there's first Judges and second Judges. I think it's Judges chapter 13. And uh, she was also barren. But then who does she produce? Samson. Right? A mighty, blessed man. And he, he produced some bad fruit. He produced some bad fruit, but guess what? He still was still, still ended up being saved. 
he received a mighty chastisement, but then he gave his life to tear down uh, the Philistines' building there and destroy them all. Those worshippers of Dagon, uh, in modern day Dagon worshippers, if you look at their practices and their fish head mitre that they would wear, you see how it ties right into Roman Catholicism and the same fish head mitre that the Roman Pope wears. So you you know you see the, the same things going on. There's nothing new under the sun, right? Then we we read about Elizabeth, again barren, right? This doesn't quite look so much like an E. And who does she give birth to? She gives birth to the man who ends up paving the way for Jesus, John the Baptist. All right? So you see how you see a lot of these people who are barren. And then eventually they end up producing a fruit that is just amazing. And I think with a lot of us, where we're not seemingly converting anybody, and we seem like we're not going to win anybody over, all right? No matter how long and hard we pray and how long we talk to these people and reason with them, it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. But a while back, my wife was telling me, you're going to be like one of those guys, I believe it was like Picasso and other people like him where nobody really liked their art until they were dead. Nobody's going to like your work until you're dead. Nobody's going to care about it until you're gone. You're not going to see the fruit of your labors in this life. Now it was just like, you know what, I, I think there might be some truth to that. Like People aren't going to believe it now, but then... Once the rapture happens and shit hits the fan, or people laugh at such a thing that I'm saying right now, such as the rapture, and then it happens, all of a sudden they're going to come back to my work, and I think it might lead to a, an untold number of people getting converted and giving their life to Jesus. Right? I mean, you you, you got to stay positive. You got to be faithful and just trust God. And just because you don't see anything doesn't mean the seed's not planted in the ground. You, do, you might not see it taking root. It may start to bud up, but maybe it's deep and it's taken a while for it to come through. Right? Or maybe every time it buds up, Satan's throwing more dirt over it or snipping it and you don't see it. Right? Or maybe there's so much weeds going on with these people, you don't see it actually coming up. You just got to have faith, right? You got to keep on keeping on. Well, some of these people, they're reaching people that have a good soil. So, yeah, they're, they're winning over these people. Sometimes they're winning over the people because they're just telling them what they want to hear. They're bringing in, in bad fish that they're not throwing back. They're trying to keep the good fish and the bad fish together. To make it look like they're more fruitful. That they can brag about such things. And then look at you as if there's something wrong with you. Right? They're blessed and you're not. Right? But you shouldn't have to worry about such things. Because ultimately the fruit is of the spirit. And that ties into, let me just use a color that stands out here. Different from what I've been using. Right here. You need to be planting the word of God in your heart. And ultimately, you produce fruit based on your relationship with God. Because how does the woman produce fruit? Well, she has to have a deep intimacy with her husband. And then she receives seed from him. And then is able to produce a child. Right? So you want to be fruitful. You need to have... A deep intimacy with God where he abides in you and you in him right 
it's hard to talk and concentrate on writing this at the same time. This is what I'll end with. Just focus on that. Don't focus on other people being fruitful. Kind of like, I believe it was Hannah's husband who was saying, Why are you so distraught that you don't have a child? Aren't I better to you than ten sons? And that's how you need to be with God, where God is better to you than having the whole world converted. All right? You're not worried about you, you producing the fruit. You're worried about your relationship with God. And if you're strong in that, you're solidified in that, maybe you produce a little bit of fruit, maybe none at all, and maybe you will end up producing an abundance through what seems to be an insignificant uh, production, that person that you convert may end up being somebody who converts thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, or more, right? You just don't know how God's going to use you and how he's going to make you fruitful. Maybe you inspire some other brothers and sisters in Christ. And they end up winning over people. You may never convert a soul. But you inspired many. And give and prepared them and fed them with the word. Where they were able to win over many. Even if it's just one. That's fantastic. So with all that being said, thanks for watching. Take care. I hope you've been encouraged. And that's that. All right. I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures, are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world and that would be the king james bible and if you're saying it doesn't say read it says hear well then read it out loud my friends i know some of you are wise asses and that's what you're going to say well then read it out loud and you build your faith and you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it that's how you obey it the gospel is the good news of our salvation that jesus christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that.
And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who were coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? Uh, it is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? And what does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified, so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. 
Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. And there was a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though what he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass. And all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian. You never listen to a thing I say because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake, feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just, instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you're probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this.
Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Amen. It's like that. Yeah. <laughs> you have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah.